first was Jordan Davis. And his words to Michael Dunn were, I'm gonna kill you. I should kill you right now. See, that's what Mr. Guy didn't tell you the facts are gonna come out prior to any gunshots being fired. We are very delighted to have with us tonight John Phillips, the attorney for the victim, Jordan Davis's family. Of course, we saw the father of the victim in court today, and this has got to be agonizing for him uh, to sit there and listen to this defense attorney for Michael Dunn say all sorts of things about his son, his son not alive, to speak up and defend himself. Uh, thanks for joining us. What do you make of the fact that uh, this was a controversial defense right from the get-go? There is the father of the deceased, Jordan Davis, by the way. Uh, this defense attorney said, hey, they did not videotape the interviews that they conducted with the three other teenagers inside the vehicle where Jordan Davis was killed. And now he's saying that they said this and they said that, all sorts of incriminating things. Well, why didn't they videotape it so we know for sure? I don't know. You know, it was a judgment call at the time by the by the prosecutors and the police. And, and you know, it's to us, it's a red herring. It's, it's something that's just, it's not essential. And as you'll recall, you were one of the first to speak to Robin Lemonitis, the first attorney for Michael Dunn. And, and from day one, this has been about defaming these boys and, and calling them thugs and gangsters and everything else. And, and it's playing out that, that the truth is they weren't. Well, uh, what do you know about when they are going to take the stand? Because I understand that it's going to happen very soon. Certainly. Angela Corey previewed, I think, a little bit to the, to the local media that something big was going to happen tomorrow. And, and the next big thing is for these boys to speak. They haven't, they've spoken, I think they did one little interview with Rolling Stone, but nobody's gotten their side out there. And it's, you know, it's tragic. Leland is one of my favorite people ever. And he's just a good kid, and he was Jordan's best friend. And like John Guy said, you know, this ultimately is the story of two best friends. Yeah, and Leland, is my understanding, was sitting next to Jordan in the back seat. Now, the defense attorney for Michael Dunn claims that he, Leland, said that the victim was advancing, was trying to get out of the vehicle. Of course, the prosecution says that's nonsense. What do you know about what you've read of his conversations with police? What do you know about that? Do you know anything about whether Leland is going to say that Jordan Davis was advancing and trying to get out of the car? John? All right, well, we have a, a little bit of difficulty. Uh, you know, he's live from Jacksonville, Florida, where all of this is happening. And we're going to take a short break. And on the other side, we're going to get him back because that's a crucial question. The crucial question is, what is Leland, the best friend of the victim, who was sitting right next to him when he was shot dead, what is he going to say when he takes a stand, possibly as soon as tomorrow? Stay right there. Jordan Davis was upset, no doubt. He was cussing, no doubt. He raised his voice. But he never threatened the defendant. He disrespected the defendant. Don't wait. Call now. And then as Mr. Guy says it, the first words Jordan Davis says, turn it back up. That didn't come from Michael Dunn. Not a single remark. Not a single curse word came from Mr. Dunn. The defendant rolled down his window again and said, are you talking to me? 
And Jordan Davis looked at him and said, yeah, I'm talking to you. And then the defendant said, you're not going to talk to me like that. We are back with John Phillips, the attorney for Jordan Davis, the victim's family. Uh, you hear this incredibly aggressive defense that's making all sorts of claims and saying, oh, you know, uh, these kids had a weapon when there's absolutely no evidence to that. But he's making claims, well, you know, the cops really didn't look for the gun, so they could have disposed of it. Your reaction to these sort of fast and loose claims that this defense is making? You know, it's conspiracy theory on top of conspiracy theory. The gate employees did something with the witnesses, which did something with the state attorney's offices, which did, I guess, something with the gun. But the gun at some point could be thrown on a roof but, or tucked under the seat, but yet it's a shotgun. So, I mean, it's, it's all over the place. And, and, you know, since day one, it's been defamation of these boys and victimization of the victims. And, and you know, the truth's going to set Jordan free, I guess you say. Well, we'll have to see what happens. And I want to thank you, John Phillips, and hope you come back soon because we are all over this case and we are going to be covering it every single night until we get to the conclusion, the verdict. I want to go back to our incredible panel and ask you about the underlying theme of this case, which is the thug, the thug word, the word that was used by this defendant when he first pulled into the convenience store slash gas station. Just on the basis of the music, he told his girlfriend... I hate that thug music. Now, uh, this is a controversial question, but I'm going to ask Boyce Watkins, founder of Your Black World out of Chicago. Is it possible that Michael Dunn had, because he said he was terrified, a genuine fear of these young men simply based on what he has perceived, uh, based on cultural stereotypes of how young African-American males behave? I've, Jada, I've been a black man for quite a while now, and I can tell you this. Uh, I've run into a lot of situations where people have feared me just because of what I look like, just because, uh, be just because I didn't bow my head or because I had a look on my face that, that maybe wasn't a smile. Um, I've gone through that my entire life, and so I identify with Jordan Davis because I was Jordan Davis as a teenager. Now I'm a professor, but I still go through what Jordan goes through. I think there certainly was uh, a thug uh, at the scene, and the, and the thug was, <laughs> was the guy who put out the gun and shot up a car full of kids because they talked smack to him. I mean, that's pretty much what went down. I really think this was a case of road rage. He said, you're not going to talk to me like that. He went to his car, he unloaded his clip, and then he drove away because he thought he could get away with it. If he really thought he had done nothing wrong, then what what do you do when you shoot somebody and you didn't do anything wrong? Think about that. You call the police so you can tell them what happened so they don't assume that you wanted to kill people. He did not do that. I think he really thought he was going to just get away with this. Rolanda Watts, uh, can we sort of uh, take from this that a middle-aged guy like Michael Dunn, a software developer, because when he goes into the interrogation, we have some video of the interrogation, he acts like nothing to see here. Like, I'm going to explain to the police that I felt scared and they're going to understand and they're going to pat me on the back and tell me to go on my merry way. <clears throat> and he is absolutely stunned when, as you're seeing now, they pat him down, uh, cuff him, and charge him with murder. Is there some kind of a stereotype, and I hate stereotypes in this country, that, well, all things being equal, the default good guy is the uh, white middle-aged software developer, and the default bad guy is the African-American teen. You know something, Jane? Uh, this is the fabric of our lives here in America. And while laws may change, attitudes don't always change. And it's not only violence that killed that child. It was an attitude that killed that child as well. Sometimes bad things make good things happen. And maybe this is a, a shining a spotlight on, on, a, on a real cancer in our country. And I do believe that there is an attitude that a life like Jordan Davis doesn't matter. And that could well, be anybody's child. Anybody. As, yeah. Listen, as long as one of us in this country is in trouble, every single one of us is in trouble in this nation. And this is something we all need to pay attention to. It could be your child next. Well, and I think the purpose of journalism, I've always said it, is not to reinforce stereotypes, but to shatter them. And so that's what hopefully we're going to do with this coverage is look at what the real facts of the case are and not what assumptions are made about people based on uh, what they look like. All right. Um, let's go out to the phone lines. David, Indiana. Are you there? David, Indiana. What you got to say? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I think the, the case is so is, is in its early stages right now. We can't really conclude anything. I'm hearing... Uh, 
I'm hearing valid arguments from the prosecutor as well as the defense, but what I'm really leaning on is there's so much reasonable doubt right now. Um, I'm not hearing a lot of forensic proof. I'm hearing good arguments from both sides, but nothing that if I were on a jury, um, right or wrong, I don't know if I could convict this guy just based on what I've heard this evening. Wow. Well, what do you have to say about that, Lonnie Coombs, former prosecutor? Well, I'll tell you, in a case like this, the forensics are going to tell you essentially how the shooting went down, but the real question for the jury is going to be, what was the defendant thinking at the time he pulled that gun? If he well, really felt I, I want to jump in because we only have a couple of seconds. Now, Angela Corey, the prosecutor who was doing some of the questioning today, and John Guy, the prosecutor who handled the opening statements, we've got video of them. We can show it. They lost the George Zimmerman trial, which is a very similar case. Exactly. So why are... Um, I'm wondering, and I'm a little confused, yeah. as to why they would be put in charge of this case. Um, Brian Claypool. Yeah. Hey, Jane, where, get Angela Corey on the phone. Where was she in the George Zimmerman trial? She, didn't, she wasn't involved in that case. Why is she previewing evidence tomorrow? She's signaling she thinks she, she has a slam dunk in this case. She has a real problem because the cornerstone of this case for Dunn is, what, did he feel reasonably threatened? Did, was his life reasonably threatened? And right now, uh, there is evidence of that. I She's going to have to deal with that. I want to give Boyce the last word. Ten seconds. Uh, I think that this case is, is, is pretty cut and dry, if you use common sense. Uh, the bad guy was the guy who pulled out the gun. The, the victims were the ones who didn't have a gun and, who, and the guy who died. And that's it's as simple as it gets. All right. Well, I certainly can tell you that the defense attorney is trying to make it as complicated as it can get. We're going to see. Tomorrow could be the star witnesses. We're all over it. Now, uh, coming up next, uh, speaking of, this is a similar case. Not with a racial component, but another one of these crazy cases, an argument in a movie theater over popcorn and somebody texting during previews, mind you. And it ended with uh, this young man being gunned down by this guy. And uh, now he's in court and this former cop, the senior citizen, is crying his eyes out. Whoa, poor me. Stay right there. And just